Well, open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, if you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 876. The passage opens this morning with a question from the Pharisees. They have something on their mind. And and I think that in this situation, it's actually a sincere question that they really are interested in knowing an answer. And they know that Jesus, who has demonstrated this authority in the scriptures, has, has demonstrated an ability to answer hard questions. And their question for Jesus is, when is the kingdom going to come? When will the kingdom come? Jesus is happy to answer that question. He provides a little bit of a preview of what those features of the kingdom will be, what they can expect, and how that kingdom will come. But as we begin this this passage this morning, I, I wonder, in our own minds, there are probably things as a culture especially and as culture and the philosophies of culture have kind of seeped in, there are things that, that become barriers for us, not only in understanding what Jesus is talking about, but barriers for us really in relating to the truths and allowing those truths to have their way in, in our lives. Like, we know that God is supreme. And we know that what Jesus did so many years ago was just a guarantee of what he is going to do in the future in bringing his kingdom, establishing his authority, reigning over the nations, and and demonstrating that, that all the things that were prophesied about him in the past, in the Old Testament, are gonna come true at some point in the future. We know that theologically, we know that doctrinally, we know that Um, academically perhaps, but the question is, does the truth about the reign of Christ, how does it affect our day to day? How does the reality of a coming king, and, and, and and a king, a God who is overall today, how does that change the way we live? How does that change the way that we respond to one another and the way we respond to him? How do we live our life from day to day in a way that demonstrates the truth, the reality of his lordship, of his sovereignty, of his authority overall? I think the picture for us begins all the way back to the beginning. It starts all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, where God is over the universe, and he begins to speak the universe into place. Then he gets to day six and this crowning achievement where where God creates men and women and built in to their creation is this image of God and the image of God is meant to reflect God's dominion, God's authority over the earth and it's really delegated authority that's meant to point to God himself. So that in Genesis 1, 26, he says, then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Well, what does that look like? Well, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, over the livestock and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Bound up in the very image of God that points and is reflected in his creation, male and female, is this dominion quality, this image-bearing testimony that points not to authority in and of itself, but authority that's under the authority of God. And what is all of that meant to do? Well, the psalmist says in Psalm 8 exactly what that's intended to do He says, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, all beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That delegated authority is meant to lead us to worship. It's meant to lead us to to wondering and marveling at, at the God who is over all. As we see and we understand the privilege of of reflecting the image of God in creation by overseeing 
and stewarding the creation that God has given to us. It is meant to lead us into worship and also, might I say, devotion to him. That we recognize that the authority that we've been given is not an authority that we possess in and of ourselves. It's authority that's been granted to us by the one who is overall. So that in every dimension of life, God has built this in to the fabric of living so that in every sphere in which we walk, there is authority to respond to, to listen to, to follow, and that not only continues to point us to the supreme authority of God, it's meant to call our own hearts to trusting in God. Because everyone in this room, everyone in this room has been met with wicked authorities. Everyone in this room has been taken advantage of of somebody in authority at some point in time or the other. And of course, that is a poor reflection of God's authority, but it's meant as those who are subjects of God ultimately to trust in faith that God is supremely over that authority and is working through those hard situations to call us into greater faith in him. You see, our response to the authorities that God has placed over us is a reflection of this attitude of trusting that God is supremely in charge. Trusting that Christ will ultimately come and reign. Trusting in the fact that God is trustworthy to work over, work through, (laughs) and, and work on behalf of our authorities to accomplish his purposes. So that, again, built into every sphere of life, there is an authority piece. Ephesians, let me just give you some examples. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. It says, children, obey your parents, what church? In the Lord, for this is right. Kids, teens, older kids, (laughs) our respect and honor, your obedience to your parents, teens, demonstrates that you trust God. It it demonstrates that, that, that even when your parents make really bad decisions and they don't seem to understand the way they should, that you trust that God is going to work through your parents to accomplish his purposes in your life. You demonstrate a commitment to trusting in God who is overall through your obedience to your parents. It is so important. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And, and as hard as that is, and, and I know that, that some of you, even in this room, have husbands that are, that are wicked Husbands that don't even love God. Husbands that don't give a rip about what the Bible says. And and even this morning, I was thanking the Lord for you. I was thanking the Lord for your example of trusting in God this way that he can work in spite of your husband to accomplish his purposes in your life and to lead you not only to, to greater faith in God, but ultimately, my prayer and my hope is what we find in 1 Peter chapter 3, that even without a word, your husbands will be one through the power of the word in your life. Husbands, of course, you're not exempt from being under authority. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, I want you to understand that at the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. The head of Christ is God. Husbands, as you lead your homes... You are responsible. You are accountable to God. He is your head. He is your authority. Submit to him as you love your wife, just like Christ loves the church. And when you do that, you show a reflection of your faith in God who is overall and supreme and will ultimately come and rule this earth with with a rod of iron. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, talks about our submission in the workplace, as it were. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by way of eye service as 
people pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. Whether you are under bondage or whether you are free in your work, Paul couldn't have punctuated this group of passage, passages anymore with look to Christ in your service, in your work. Do it as to Christ and not to men. Trusting that Christ will, will give you fruit from that work. You will receive back from the Lord whether you are a slave or free. You can trust him. And of course, 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 and 15 talks about the sphere of authorities that we experience in just the world itself. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to king as supreme or emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. We prepare for the future coming of Christ today in how we respond to the authorities that God has placed over us. If you find that the reality of Christ's coming, his imminent return, is not something you think about very often, maybe, maybe it's because you haven't nurtured the concept of submission to authorities that point to faith in God. Because as we do this, when, especially when times are hard, we're like, okay, Lord, I'm gonna do it another day, but I'm trusting you that when you return, you're gonna set all this right. That's what begins to work in our life, conditioning our hearts, leading us to trust and hope for this future coming of Christ. And so Jesus, as he begins to answer this question, we're gonna see in, in, in verse 20 through 21, we're gonna see Jesus is more than happy to answer this question of the Pharisees because he wants them to know what to expect And he wants his disciples to also understand and future disciples to understand what this kingdom will look like. And so we're gonna see this morning five features of this coming kingdom. Five features of this reign of Christ and see how that reality, that truth, those truths should shape the way we live today. First, the kingdom comes spiritually. The kingdom comes spiritually. Notice in verse 20, In 21, it says, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look here it is or there, or for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. When is the kingdom coming, Jesus? The Pharisees ask. It seems out of place when I, when I, when I, when I came to this passage, I'm thinking, where in the world was this coming from? Why are they asking this question? Of course, they understand that the kingdom of God was something that Jesus had taught about from the very beginning of his ministry. This whole concept of the kingdom comes up at least 45 times in the book of Luke alone. 32 times we find this phrase, kingdom of God. And so Jesus was serious about the kingdom of God and and teaching about the kingdom realities. And and, and so the Pharisees, understanding, remembering what Jesus had taught, are thinking, what does this kingdom look like? So they ask him this question. I also think that in the weeks, the couple of weeks leading up to Passover, there was this, this fresh wave of anticipation of, of will this be the time when the king sets up his throne in Jerusalem? Notice in Luke chapter 19, verse 11, it says, they, when they heard these things, or as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was about to appear immediately. This anticipation, this fever pitch of enthusiasm of what would this kingdom look like and when will this kingdom come, certainly this is the time. That was what they were thinking. But their minds were confused. They, they, they knew about the reality of, of a kingdom, but they forgot that the kingdom would be preceded by suffering. We're gonna look at that as we move through this passage. First and foremost, the kingdom 
was spiritual. Jesus, God, was interested in creating a people of worship from the very beginning. Christ's kingdom was first spiritual. It's always been that way. This good news of the kingdom that was preached, proclaiming liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. And of course, there was a physical reality to that, but it was just pointing to the deeper, greater reality of being liberated from sin, the captives that are gonna be liberated, the blindness that's gonna be given sight to, the spiritual blindness, recovery of sight that Jesus intended to bring. He was always intended to create a worshiping community. Going all the way back to Abraham, we find in Genesis chapter 17, I'm just gonna key in on just the phrase here in verse seven and eight. It says, I will establish my covenant between you and me, your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. It was about worship first, about creating a people that were devoted to God. There was a land, there would be uh, children, there would be an inheritance, but it was primarily so those people could worship God, would be devoted to him. In the Mosaic Covenant, we find in Exodus chapter 19, verses five and six, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. That was the heart of God, creating a worshiping community, creating a spiritual people. And of course, that's what Christ's death and resurrection, that's what the good news generated. We find that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. It says, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Does that sound familiar? to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen generation, verse nine says, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This present coming of Christ was intended to create a spiritual people. It will be interesting, it will be important to des- or differentiate the, the difference between the coming that we see in verse 20 versus the coming that we're gonna see in verse 22. Here, our coming in verse 20 is in the present indicative. The coming that we're gonna read about in verse 22 is in the future indicative. That's a coming that is yet to be seen, yet to be known, yet to be experienced. But the present coming, the present ministry of Christ was a coming that came spiritually. It wasn't observable. Jesus wasn't creating armies. He wasn't amassing political power. He wasn't meant to sit on a throne during his first ministry. It was about changing hearts confronting sin, claiming people to himself, reuniting or reorienting their desire for him. In this way, the kingdom wasn't visible because it was within them. It it was meant to be uh, a a kingdom that, that started in their hearts and that wasn't visible. It wasn't tangible. It wasn't something that you could see and point your finger to. But it was just a foreshadowing of a future kingdom that Jesus was intending to create. We come to this first point, we ask ourselves the question, is Christ that kind of king for you? Is he that kind of king for me? Is his kingdom settled in my heart in such a way that he's purging sin? He's convicting me of the ways that I walk out of step with his word. Is his Holy Spirit ministering to me in such a way that he's leading me into truth, leading me to love Jesus more, following Jesus more, devoting myself to Jesus more consistently in worship? The affection of my heart is for him. 
That's what this kingdom, this spiritual kingdom, is intended to begin. So that I'm prepared for this future kingdom that we're gonna look at in just a moment. Are we living in this present reality of the kingdom creating within us a spiritual life that loves God? When we come to verse 22, we see the kingdom comes powerfully. The kingdom comes powerfully. Notice, and he said to his disciples, now he's turning to them, he's turned his attention away from the Pharisees, now he's directing his attention, his instruction to the disciples and says, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. What in the world is Jesus talking about? Well, drop down to verse 26 for a moment. He says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. Now drop down to verse 28. It says, likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot. Verse 30, so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. The days are coming, and this operative phrase, this designation of who Jesus is, his identity as the Son of Man is gonna be instrumental for us in understanding what he means in the next several verses of our passage. Here, the coming that Jesus is referring to is a future coming, something that will be seen. The days are coming. It's unstoppable. It's going to happen. Nothing will get in the way. Although there will be some, and we understand through the generations of those believers who've lived and died, there was a longing to see that day when Jesus would come. There there was a longing to participate in that kingdom whether because of persecution or whether it was because of of just longing for and wanting to see the glory of Christ established on the earth. But they did not see it. We're still anticipating that future reality, but it will come. This will not be, this is not a minor promise in the Bible. As a matter of fact, 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament explicitly refer to the Lord's return. In the 260 chapters of the New Testament, there are 300 instances in which Christ's apostles make reference to his second coming. This is not a minor truth. And his first coming guarantees and establishes that that his future coming is also secured. It's guaranteed. So what creates this anticipation? What creates this desire What creates this desire to see this return is a love for the king, the love for his kingdom. For centuries, believers from around the world have greatly desired to see the return of Christ. Yearning. This yearning should mark us as God's people. A longing to see his mission, his ministry, his sovereignty established over the earth. This operative Identity, the Son of Man, is pulled from Daniel chapter 7. We're in this prophetic section of Daniel. Daniel recounts in verse 1 In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. And in the verses that follow, we find that in this dream there are four beasts, which are explained to be four different kingdoms. And then a fifth kingdom arises and the description of that kingdom is found in verse 13. It says this, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the cloud of heaven there came one like the son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is the title that Jesus is is using in lifting up and applying to himself. This description, the son of man, which was used of Christ more than any other description. It was his favorite title for himself throughout his ministry, used some 80 times throughout the gospels. It was meant to point to this future kingdom, this future destination of Christ's reign over all the earth. So that we find in Luke chapter 21, he he will pick this theme up again. And in verse 27, he says, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. 
This son of man will reign, will conquer, will demonstrate his authority over the entire earth. And so then in Revelation, we find again this picture of the Son of Man and this prophecy that is recorded about him throughout the duration of Revelation. It says in verse 13 of chapter one, and in the midst of the lamb stands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a gold sash around his chest. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. Next slide. And the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. The book of Revelation is the book of this son of man and the record of what he will do to demonstrate his authority over the earth in judgment over sin and establishing his throne. This picture weaves itself throughout the entire book of Revelation. We see it over and over again. Jesus will make good on his promise to conquer his enemies And he will do it in a way that is visible, verifiable, and physical, just as he did at his first coming. The prophecies that pointed to this future suffering Savior that all the earth got to witness, that all the earth, at least in Jerusalem, got to see, it was visible, it was verifiable, it was physical. In the same way, Christ will fulfill the prophecy that he's given to us in his ministry and of the prophets in the past to set up and establish his kingdom on the earth as the son of man. He will come with power and no one and no force will be able to stand in his way. So how should we live? Based on that reality, what should be true of our lives? How should we live in light of the fact that the king is coming? Well, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, he says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in his body, whether good or evil. The king is coming. The judge is ready to evaluate your life, the good and the bad. And of course, (laughs) the good doesn't outweigh the bad. In God's economy, if we've uh, offended in one way, we're guilty of all. If we've sinned in just one little spot, we're guilty of breaking the law in totality. The only thing that can cover our sin is the righteousness of Christ, the blood of Christ. The precious blood of Christ that we've been purchased with, his death, his resurrection, his righteousness covers those who are in him, who have pledged their faith in Christ and asked for forgiveness of sin 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us, not just from a few, but from all unrighteousness. And so on that judgment day, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the question will be, not were your works good enough to save you? Because there's only one work that matters. It's the, it's, it's the work that goes all the way back to the example of Abraham, that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Do you stand as one this morning who has trusted in Christ as the only way of salvation, who has, who's asked forgiveness for your sin, is trusting that Jesus alone can save you from the penalty that you and I deserve? This kingdom is coming. It's coming powerfully. Are you ready? Does your heart demonstrate a readiness? In verse 23, we we learn something more about the kingdom, that it comes unmistakably. Notice this in verse 23. And they will say to you, look there or look here. Do not go out or follow them, for as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Jesus repeats the statement that he has mentioned to the Pharisees 
And, 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 and he repeats this for emphasis to, to help his disciples understand that there are going to be a lot of deceivers out there. A lot of people trying to, to, to direct your attention to the, the private work of Christ in coming to establish his kingdom. Hey, we've got some special information. We've got this mystery over here. Come take a look. We, we know when Jesus is going to come back. We, we, we've been be able to predict the, the signs and the times of his return. Don't believe it. Don't listen for, for even a moment. Don't follow them or give in to their deception. Don't give them money. Don't support their ministry. Don't trust them because Jesus has said emphatically that unlike his first coming, which was private, his first coming, which was uh, secluded in Bethlehem, his, his first coming that was only really known by the shepherds, his second coming will be as visible as the lightning that streaks across the sky. Unmistakable. Even if you're not even looking at the sky, the, the whole night turns into day, depending on, on how much lightning there is. Jesus repeats the same warning in Luke chapter 21, where he says in verse eight, he said, See that you're not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I'm he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. Do not believe them. Christ's return will be unmistakable, like lightning that flashes across the sky. Revelation chapter one, verse seven, makes this abundantly clear. Notice Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Jesus will return. It will be clear. It will be obvious. And Christ's suffering paves the way for that return of glory. As we see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Of this salvation, it says, the prophets inquired and searched carefully who prophesied the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them indicated when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Just as Christ came to suffer, he suffered physically, he suffered visibly, so he will also return and establish his kingdom in a visible, physical way. Christ's death on the cross paved the way for that future victory. First he conquered death, and then he will conquer every other enemy. In verse 26 and 30, we find the kingdom comes suddenly. The kingdom comes suddenly. Notice, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. The kingdom comes suddenly. And I've chosen that word by design because... It's not that the kingdom comes unexpectedly. It's not that, that, that the king hasn't been very clear about this future judgment that is on its way. It's not that the world is, 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 is unaware of this future judgment that has been promised. As a matter of fact, our family was just watching a show on Netflix uh, a couple of days ago, and they were scoffing at the rapture, so it's, you know, Here's a secular show, had nothing to do with, with God in any way, and yet they were very aware of this promise of a future rapture and a future judgment. The world knows. They're not unaware. This is not unexpected. Just like during the days of Noah, where Noah was a preacher of righteousness and he spelled out the doom that was about to fall on them, our people today are aware but it will come suddenly. It will come in a way that, that they're caught off guard. Just as in the days of Noah, this judgment that God brings will be, will be cataclysmic. In the days of Noah, it came through cataclysmic judgment of water. In the days of Lot, it came through cataclysmic judgment by fire. 
In both descriptions that Jesus gives here, describe an entire population that was wiped out because of sin. In the days of Noah, every person on the earth was obliterated. During the days of Lot, every person living in Sodom in the surrounding regions of Gomorrah were obliterated because of judgment of sin. But both are also descriptions of God's mercy. They're descriptions of God's kindness. Descriptions of God's deliverance of a few. Noah and his sons and daughters-in-law were saved from the flood. Lot and his wife and his daughters and the extended mercy that was also offered to potential sons-in-law who remained in Sodom. Of course, Lot's wife turned back and so the initial deliverance that she experienced was turned into judgment as her heart and affection was for Sodom instead of for God. But the mercy of God to deliver us from judgment is still present, it's still available. The activity we see here, this, uh, they're oblivious of the, of the doom that is coming, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, buying and selling, planting and building. We find something of this scoffing that comes in Second Peter chapter three, verse three, when future scoffers will say, they will come in the last days with scoffing saying, following their sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. This promise of God's future judgment has been intact for thousands of years. Where is God? He's not gonna carry out this promise. But they forget that God has been slow for a reason. God has been patient for a reason. We find that in 2 Peter 3.9. It says the Lord is not The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Don't scoff at the patience of God. Don't criticize the kindness of God to wait. God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. It's meant to draw us to his mercy. It's meant to help us have time to come to terms with who he is, to bow the knee in asking for forgiveness in, in coming to a place of, of enjoying this, the benefits of his sovereign reign over the earth and deliverance of sin, to enjoy his reign in fullness. Do you know Jesus this morning? Or are you taking advantage of his kindness? Oh, may God help us to understand that the slowness of God is meant and intended for mercy. This final point, the kingdom comes forcefully. We're gonna spend some time developing this some more (laughs) next week because I really wanna turn our attention in the the final few moments here to, to, to apply this to our lives. What is the reality of the kingdom meant to do for us? What what is the fact that Jesus is coming back to establish his kingdom? What what is that meant to do? How how does it change today? How does it change tomorrow? How does it change this next week? What what is that meant to do in our lives? Well, I think there are two main ways for us to apply this passage today. First, the first is to be warned. Be warned. 2 Peter 3, verses 11 to 13 says, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt away as they burn. But according to his promises, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. As we anticipate this future coming of Christ, this day of the Lord, this day of judgment, this day of setting up his throne, what sort of people ought we to be? People who anticipate the judge who's coming. 
People who live lives that are in accord with the mission and purpose that God has given to us, who who understand the foundation of the scriptures and are seeking to live in a way that represents this accountability of this judge who is coming and standing at the door who will evaluate our lives, seeking to live lives that are worthy of the calling with which we've been called. Be warned. Be warned. What, What a benefit it is for us to know that Jesus is coming so that we can be warned. But second, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 to 11, he says, for God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Okay, let me just unpack this for a moment. The day of the Lord is synonymous with a day of wrath. It's what we read about in, in, in Revelation where God will come, he will judge the earth, he will vent his wrath, he will pour out his fury on ungodliness and wickedness of those who are living in a wicked way on the earth. But for those of us who are in Christ, for those of us who have believed in Jesus for forgiveness of sins, Jesus has graciously absorbed that wrath on our behalf. The wrath of God was vented on Jesus on the cross. The wrath of God was poured out on him in totality. Jesus has reconciled us to God by paying that wrath to God for our sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So those who are in Christ, Christ has already experienced that wrath for us so that we don't have to experience it. So we're not destined for wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So in that day of wrath, we will be preserved because the wrath of God was taken by Jesus for us. So be encouraged that whatever tribulations and persecution and troubles you're experiencing today are just momentary. There is a hope of a future with God in heaven because of the work of Christ on our behalf and we can be encouraged as we anticipate this future coming of Christ in establishing his kingdom on the earth. Let's praise him together. Father, we praise you for sending your son Jesus. Thank you for the work that he did in his first coming to suffer for sins, to be victorious over death so that In his second coming, we can experience the culmination of that victory in his vanquishing of his foes on the earth, establishing his kingdom and drawing us in to enjoy the king who is in authority over all, who is supreme over all. Lord, I pray that today and throughout the rest of our life, we would nurture a spirit that it's submissive to you as we seek to submit our lives to the authorities that you've placed over us. Help us in that to trust you. Help us, Lord, to demonstrate a confidence in your future return. May there be a hope that is indescribable for those who look at our lives and they see that there's a settled confidence in what you are doing through us what you are doing for us and what you will do in the future to establish yourself as king over all, king of kings and lord of lords. We praise you in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, have a great day.